Oh, wow, I'm overwhelmed. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Robert. That was, uh, I think, the best introduction I've ever gotten. So um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's always nice to come back to home. Uh, as Robert said, I do still feel like Texas is home. So um, tonight, uh, I want to talk about our, pro our work. And I've typified it with these three words, water, dirt, and buildings. And then I've added, in parentheses, Dallas, because maybe Dallas is different, or all of those things, somehow special. <clears throat> so I'll start with water. So here we are in the east end of London. So this is, of course, for the London Games. And everybody thinks of the, of the Olympics as being in London, but you can see by this uh, subway map that actually East London is, is not London. It is a site more like this. And of course, this is actually after the uh, construction had begun for the games. So you can see that big round pad that was already being cleared for the stadium. But just suffice it to say, East London, post-industrial, highly polluted, uh, crime-ridden historically, poverty-ridden, Jack the Ripper did his stuff in East London. So this was the setting for the 2012 games. Uh, very, as I said, a very polluted site. Um, so one of the things they had to do immediately was take the soil and put it into giant trucks and bake it to make it banal and then put it back so that we could then work that soil. So when we were hired, <clears throat> As both the Olympics we worked on, we were hired at sort of an emergency last minute, not last minute, but 11th hour, to come in and save the day. Because they had a master plan, and this was that master plan, and you can see how much gray there is in that master plan. So the poor little River Lee running through the middle of it, some green, but a whole lot of gray. And they said, you know, we think we have an issue. So we had worked on the Sydney Games, so the first thing we did was look at where people would be coming from and, how, and what percentage they would be arriving. Uh, you can see here most people were coming from the train station. So we said, you know, you've got a lot more paving than you need, and you only need it for six weeks anyway. So let's figure out a way to make the river the subject of this place, make the river the address, reduce redundant paving, and simplify this plan so that the park can be the foreground. So in these sections, <clears throat> you see on the left the existing conditions. Much of the river had uh, concrete and or steel walls. But you can see in the top of each section was what the previous master plan was. And then below that is how we said, let's lay the banks back. Let's give you space to feel the river, to create a real river, and give you views to the river. So in the northern part, we could really lay the banks back. And in the southern part, we could terrace the banks next to the stadium. So we didn't have much time because they were already building on the site. And we had to change the direction of what they were doing rapidly. So we had a London office at that time. And we got everybody in the room. And that model on the left is how we started. And that's the same model on the right. So for those of you who might be landscape, young landscape architects or landscape architecture students, you still should make physical models. And you still should, still should do drawings with your hands. But by using clay and carving the clay, we were able to make sure we were balancing cut and fill on the site. So we were convincing these developers of these big venues that they could make a better environment for the games and save money. <clears throat> and I love to go back and forth. Let me do that again. To go from that model to this shot after construction. Uh, it always kind of blows me away to see when it's built how much it looks like uh, the models and the drawings. But you can see in this, in this image the, how the banks of the river are laid back. They're carved. They're sculpted. It creates a variety of places for people, flora, and fauna. <clears throat> so here's the master plan in a northern park and a southern park. And you can see the stadium. Just to the right of the stadium is, I have a pointer here, just to the right of the stadium. So here's the stadium. And that's Zaha Hadid's natatorium, or aquatic center, right there. So 
The North Park is the environmental park, if you will. So uh, 4,000 trees, 300,000 wetland plants, 13 acres of nectar-rich meadows. And we had to leave behind, we were given biodiversity targets. So we were told that we had to leave behind a certain number of different biozones to support habitat after the games. So it's really interesting to think about how the British did the games as opposed to the right after Beijing games. So it wasn't about display and spectacularness. It was about legacy. And one of those legacies was about restoring a river and, a, and the habitat uh, that would go along it. At the same time, that North Park and the carving of this river and laying back the banks of this river uh, creates flood relief because instead of just moving those problems downstream, as we have done all over the United States, like the Corps of Engineers did in so many of our cities, you need to give a place for those floods to spread out, be absorbed, slow down, and uh, help solve the problems downstream. <clears throat> so we moved over a, a million and a half cubic yards of contaminated soil uh, that, like I said, was baked and washed, uh, 33,000 tons of silt and rubble uh, to make um, more canals and to clean up the river. This is during construction, and it's quite tricky to build in a river. So here we are trying to establish these, not trying, but establishing these wetlands. And you can see the porous orange fences around them so that the water would allow the plants uh, to be established while growing in water. And you can see the strong sculptural landforms. That's a closer up shot. So building in rivers is, is tricky. And the water quality in the river was not good. So in the beginning, the contractors started uh, in the, in, before the irrigation system was in, they were watering the trees with river water and it was killing the trees. So it shows you the, the, the transformation over time that this kind of system can help make happen. So here's right after installation and you can see that wetland really getting established and those riparian trees. So we had lowland meadows, lowland riparian, Midland meadows, upland meadows, you know, so many different levels of habitats by creating this terracing. And one of the things I love about this image is the sculpting of these landforms working with the velodrome in the background. The velodrome, I think, is the best building at the London Olympic site. And of course, that's where the British won their only gold medal uh, in Beijing. So they love their velodrome. And some of the structures, like this one, actually were inflatable and deflated and went to the next site uh, for the games. But here again, you see that layering of terraces from very riparian edge, wetland edge, up to upland meadows. So it was able to host people watching the games so you could hang out on these meadows, um, lawns, you could watch the games on these big screens that were in the river, and you could really feel the kind of respite of being in this natural environment, but with hundreds of thousands of people attending these games. And of course, you can see the orbit, um, Amish Kapoor's orbit in the background and the stadium. And here it is during the Paralympics. So it lasts through um, the Olympic Games and then the Paralympics as well. <clears throat> So it, our trick was to create a place that would feel good uh, with, like I said, hundreds of thousands of people, but that would also feel good for one person. And that would create a place of nature and a respite from the city that kids would enjoy, people would enjoy, our uh, animals and wildlife uh, would also enjoy. So we were, this is one of the habitats we were uh, asked to recreate. This is a specific habitat for a specific frog. <clears throat> so then the southern, the southern uh, park, the South Park, is the Olympic Gardens site. So again, the British, don't give us an Olympic fountain, we want Olympic gardens. So, <clears throat> and we want uh, various kinds of habitat to be established uh, via these gardens. So we came up with the idea of theming the gardens on the various countries who come to the games to compete. Really a nod to the British legacy of plant collection. So the British love their, they love their gardens, they go all over the world, they collect plants. <clears throat> and indeed, the mayor of London called the, the gardens the winner of the Olympic Games. 
<clears throat> so here in this part of the site is more a more terraced relationship to the river, a more formal terraced relationship to the river, and a kind of mix of planting that's both wild but at times structured. So you have this contrast of a formal garden, maybe in a traditional European sense, but also a kind of informality and casualness in a more British pastoral sense as well. <clears throat> And again, be loved by kids of all ages. And so each of these gardens was themed on different countries or different biozones, really. Um, so encompassing more than one country in each of these uh, uh, garden types. I think this one was North America. But it was tricky because we were planning something to be very precise, to be perfect, at this moment of the games in 2012, but we were at the same time unfurling a system, a landscape system, that would have to uh, work for many, for many, many years to come. And this was the first park to be built in Great Britain in 150 years. So we had a legacy to follow up on and a new uh, marker to set for future. So also, how to connect it to its surroundings how to make a new neighborhood for the east end of London, uh, creating a series of green spaces that would be what we called fields as destinations, stitches as ecological and programmatic corridors, making, maximizing therefore ecological uh, connectivity and systems, and at the same time, making a place that would entice developers to, to come and develop residential, and again, create this new neighborhood in east London. <clears throat> all of which I'm happy to say has happened. So quickly, I'll go through another water example. This is, um, this is China, obviously. This is uh, 2005. This is Tianjin. So note how it's just really just industrial. And then note by 2013, already high rises and already our park um, beginning here. So rapid development that eventually will look like this. So how to create a river park system that would in some ways mitigate this level of density and this level of development. A real thickened edge, if you will, at the water's edge that would treat water but give thousands and thousands of trees as a, a sort of uh, lung to uh, this dense place and a series of systems of water management, green management, circulation movement. Um, one of the things we learned in this Chinese culture is that people don't play sports in parks, for instance. They don't throw balls, or, and they don't sunbathe, and they don't fly kites so much, but they stroll and they love horticulture. And this area around Tianjin is where there are a lot of nurseries growing you know, tens of thousands of trees to be planted all over the country. So we really took that kind of vocabulary of nurseries and applied it to in an almost in horticultural way on the site. <clears throat> and I think you get a sense of it there. So a real plant collection and um, made for strolling, for spending time, and in, it, it just the contrast to the adjacency is um, pretty spectacular. It's also a water taxi stop. And now the neighborhood around it. So it really preceded the neighborhood around it. And now the neighborhood around it is growing. <clears throat> so across the river, the new Juilliard School. So Juilliard is building a new campus in Tianjin. And we're doing that project with Diller, the architects Diller Scafidio Renfro. So they're designing this new uh, building, which the mayor wanted to be low rise and not too wacky. Those were the, those were the, the instructions. And of course, we looked at it and said, well, <clears throat> you're on the river, we can create a river park, and you're, op you're on the opposite bank of the river park we did. So let's make this about the public as an open access public park where performances could happen on the riverfront and the screen of the building becomes a screen. So the building bec really becomes part of the performance of what's happening inside or expression of what's happening inside, um, but broadcast um, into the river park. 
<clears throat> it's under construction now. So now to move to a different river, this is the mighty Mississippi in New Orleans. Uh, Post-Katrina, uh, the city really needed to reclaim its waterfront to again have a positive relationship to its waterfront. So of course the Mississippi had natural levees formed by batcher, batcher is a French word for the accumulation of trash essentially, along that naturally accum accumulated along the banks of the Mississippi. So the Mississippi did not flood. So what the, what the city and we had to do was convince the port was to convince the port to give up some properties that they were no longer using. Now, for any of you who've tried to work with ports in any cities in this country, they're one of the hardest institutions or agencies to get to give up land. But because of the sort of post-crisis, post-trauma state of New Orleans, they gave this land over to be a park and a place of memory uh, designed by Sir David Adjaye, both this pier, this wharf, and this bridge. And the park that we did, of course, recalling <clears throat> the rail lines that uh, once were active on the site and using that pattern to trace the, the, the paths through the gardens and the planting in the gardens. The bridge is known as the, affectionately locally known as the Rusty Rainbow. But really, at an industrial site, this is Piety Wharf, if any of you know New Orleans, this is Piety Wharf, and this whole area across the tracks now that this bridge connects to is now booming with artists, studios, coffee shops, galleries, people are starting to move in, so it's becoming a real neighborhood, um, and the bridge is pretty spectacular. And at the other, it's a mile long, so that's one end. At the other end is this area where we took an old existing shed and just sort of took the walls down, opened it up, make it a place where they have markets, events, art fairs, and you can see here the bridge over the railroad of a different character, and here there's an elevator. But the view to the city is spectacular. Now these barges are a bit of a problem. They've actually run into the park a couple of times. <laughs> but we hung up these big swings and um, people love it and it's become a neighborhood park as well as a place people visit when they go to town, come to town. Okay, so I'm moving from water to dirt. Okay, ground. So <clears throat> here we are in Houston, Texas. So does this look like Houston or what? So this is in the 1980s. So this is b right before the convention center. So the convention center was built right here. Uh, the George R. Brown Convention Center. But you can see just vast acreages of parking. And on that site now, what Landscape Architecture Magazine called the biggest little park in the world because there's, uh, uh, a, you can do a lot there, yet it's still just a simple green park in many ways. And you see the Convention Center on the right. And in this picture, development beginning to happen, and I'll show you a picture in a minute where more and more of that is happening. So a series of outdoor rooms, simple group. When we were hired, we were asked to create something beautiful and green, really that Houston legacy. My mother was in the Garden Club. I mean, this idea of gardens and green and oasis and cool, but they were terrified that no one would come, so they wanted to make sure we had plenty of things to do in the park. Well, that hasn't been a problem that millions of people visit each year. But one of the things we had to conquer was how to put parking underneath it. So this is the entrance to the parking structure with the beautiful building designed by Page, as well as the beautiful cafe building designed by Page, and the restaurant, The Grove, there, also divine, designed by Page. So uh, working very closely with Larry Speck at the time. So the... Um, the ramp ramps down into the parking garage below, and there's parking below all of this, including below the lake. So the parking ramp really guided us on the tectonics of that sloped amphitheater. We did have this amazing alley of historic oak trees that really helped. <clears throat> and there's the Grove restaurant, which is a really good restaurant and a great source of income for the park. So it's used in a variety of ways. There's always something going on on the stage, whether it's planned like this or yoga classes 
are a circus class. Last time I was there on the stage. Things to do in the park like bocce, strolling around the lake, and of course the interactive fountain being one of the major draws. So kids come here by school bus loads, kids who don't have swimming pools in their backyards or in their neighborhoods. Um, to play in the fountain. <clears throat> and it's a beacon at night. It really is a sort of downtown uh, a lantern. And the art in the park, this is right after installation, so the gardens still look like uh, agriculture, but they're very lush and, and grown in now. But you can sit in one of those and whisper, and the person in the other one hears you. So one time, there was a guy sitting in one just hanging out, and I sat in the other one and said, hello there. And he just about jumped out of his skin. <laughs> So those are by uh, the artist Douglas Hollis, a friend, longtime collaborator, who also did this mystery, what he called the mystery, which is a favorite uh, for kids. And then Margot Sawyer, a Texas artist, um, did these with Paige, collaborated on these structures that are the head houses for the stairways and elevators down to the parking garage below. So one in these orange colors and one in these cooler colors. Some of them are semi-transparent, so when you're inside of them, the light comes through and there's squares of color um, all over. They're really quite spectacular and beautiful. And then there are temporary art installations, like at Christmas, these ornaments with the faces of Eustonians are the Field of Light by the artist Bruce Monroe. So that people come to Discovery Green even when it's cold and rainy because they want to see what's happening each holiday season. So when we started, this is what it was like. Surface parking, surface parking, surface parking. And this is what's happening now. So uh, development all around it. And this is what it looks like now. In fact, it already is different because the Marriott Marquis is now in place here which I recently stayed in. So a billion dollars of development around this park as a result of this park. So civic leaders, philanthropists, and a mayor who wanted this change to happen made this happen. And you can see the way the gardens have grown in. They're incredibly lush and beautiful. And we, we added this deck because so many people were hanging out in the grass under the oak trees, the grass was not surviving. So that's the one change that we have made, which is adding this long, long deck. And you can see one of the oak trees comes up through the deck. And if you go there now, you'll see the play area is uh, fenced off and under construction because we're expanding the play area as well and making a new entrance to the park. The park was surrounded by parking when we built it, so it was kind of buffered in some of the corners. Now those corners are fully developed with residential, hotel, and office, so we're opening up those corners and putting new signage at every corner. So it's 10 years later, still evolving. One of my favorite things is this uh, 2015 year in, in review, and it's fun to read. I mean, you know, 20,000 doggy visits, who can go wrong? 117,000 fitness hours, but look at the demographics of the people who come there from all over the city. It really is a melting pot. But the pie chart's my favorite part because I think our profession gets lost in the what they believe is the importance of creating things to do. We need to stop doing that. You look at that pie chart and people go to Discovery Green because it's outdoors and it's free and it's landscape. We need nature in our lives and sometimes we should remember to focus on that. Okay, ground. Sometimes we claim the ground by making a paving pattern. This is in Baton Rouge. Uh, by making a paving pattern that extends across a street, claims a street, and extends into the adjacent park, thereby making a space bigger and pedestrianizing a street, even though there's still cars. They feel like they're the intruder. <clears throat> and this beautiful pattern sort of reflects the rippling of the nearby Mississippi. And of course, there were some beautiful oak trees there that didn't hurt. Are, in this case, creating ground um, that's vertical. So sometimes creating green walls, in this case, covering up the awful blank facade of an adjacent parking structure uh, for this uh, plaza in downtown San Francisco, and being a great uh, backdrop for these fabulous sculptures. but really lush. And the, the key was creating trays of soil and tr with water, not just trying to plant these plants at the base and expecting them to grow up, but creating a vertical landscape. And it's a structure that's independent of the wall behind it. 
And I'll end, I'll end dirt with an old project, and you can tell it's a little bit older because these are slides, so they don't quite have that crisp high res we now expect the eye candy to always give us. But this is a residence. So I did want to show you the scale change from you know, Olympic sites of 275 acres to residence. Uh, residences, and this is Ken and Judy's rate, uh, Ken and Judy Dayton's residence in Minneapolis, and we really manipulated the ground here to really show off their uh, sculpture collection, their pretty fabulous sculpture collection, and this beautiful house designed by Vincent James. So you see these ripples at one end of the house, and you at the front of the house, you see the ripples in the landscape we created here. But then um, a big lake is here. Of course, it's Minnesota, land of lakes. So we created this ha-ha, this edge, this, this swoopy edge with a ha-ha here that you don't see. So you feel like you look forever across the horizon. You see that arc, and you see that beautiful Richard Serra. Um, and then that edge and the lake. So it seems like you are right perched over the edge of the lake. But if you fall, there's a ha-ha. <clears throat> And then these series of outdoor rooms and gardens with this uh, amazing collection of sculpture from Sia Armanjani to Ellsworth Kelly. Okay, buildings, because some of our landscapes are buildings. They're infrastructure, essentially. So this is Penn's Landing in Philadelphia. So this is the way it looks today. Um, <clears throat> downtown Philadelphia over here, and in fact, the historic part of Philadelphia, you can see Independence Hall right here. Um, really weird grade changes, I-95, Columbus Boulevard, this horrible Penn's Landing where they have uh, festivals in the summer and the winter, ice skating in the winter. People go, but it's really awful. And they wanted us to create a park that would cap over all of this and connect to the river and thereby release new development sites or reveal new development sites uh, for private development to create a new neighborhood. So one of the problems we faced was how to give you a view of the river when you're coming from the city because the existing pedestrian bridges and in this case vehicular bridge arched up before they arched back down. So we wanted to create this kind of connection with these kinds of visual corridors and actual physical connection and future development sites as you see here and here and here and connection to the city and connection at all these levels, so down at Columbus Boulevard level, crossing over the free wall, freeway level and at the water's edge, um, to create a park that would, this much of it, be over structure, and this much of it tilting down to the river. So let me just go back for a minute to that section. So the existing structure used to do that, and we came up working with the structural engineers we came up with a way to make a structure that was thinner and actually slope toward the river and then toward the river so that from the city you have a sense of progression to the river. So that took working with engineers on an infrastructural problem and making it a landscape amenity and opportunity. So just to go back for a second, so ice skating, a pavilion, a cafe, play, Two memorials, an Irish memorial and a Scottish memorial that needed to go off but come back. Uh, gardens, an amphitheater, um, and an esplanade at the river's edge. And then parking lots that are already out for developer RFP. So they will be residential in no time at all. And so you can see this green corridor extending from the heart of the city uh, to the Delaware River for the first time, claiming that adjacency and relationship to the Delaware River. And that's the idea of future development that will be coming uh, sooner rather than later around these urban gardens and this slope. So from the cafe, you'll have this sense of being sort of on the prow of a ship perched out over the topography before it slopes down so that you really have that sense of prospect. As Olmsted said, prospect and refuge, the two keys to making a great park. And then of course, joy, we can't forget joyfulness. Uh, and the structure. So it really came down to the only way to make this park work and not be high in the air so that you would have to walk up to get to it from the city was to make the structure of the of the deck actually embed, have, have landscape embedded within it. So a kind of waffle 
or mattress-like structure where the trees are in the troughs and the utilities are all in the troughs. Uh, so you won't, you won't know that in the, when you're in the park, but the trees are where they can be based on these troughs and that's the steel structural system. It's not unlike Clyde Warren Park, except Clyde Warren Park is a concrete structure and this is a steel structure because freeze thaw, uh, snow, ice, etc. Okay, so a different kind of infrastructure. This is uh, Denver Union Station neighborhood in lower downtown Denver. So you can see the historic tr train station and the rail lines here. None of these buildings existed, but here was the river Here's 16th Street and the shuttle, and then uh, downtown. So we and SOM did this master plan for a future neighborhood, uh, Denver Union Station neighborhood, and all kinds of transportation happening. So the 16th Street shuttle, for anybody who's been there, you've been on it. A light rail station, so this was new light rail coming in, light rail station here. The train station, the real train station here, and then beneath all of this, a bus station. So a major bus transfer station. So in three dimension, you can see the historic train station, the bus station below, uh, park above, and new development along it. Now this was at a time when everyone thought it would take a really long time for this to be to develop, but in fact it has developed really fast. And I think it's because they invested in the public realm first and created a place first. Also, it didn't hurt that Union Station is now a boutique hotel with really great retail within it. And it's become a kind of living room for the city. People go there just to hang out in this historic train station, which you can still catch a train from. So the fountain out front, uh, we did these sort of lines of arcs of jets that move. So as if trains are coming in and out of the station, these jets progress and then progress the other way and then progress the other way. And of course, they are always in use. And already residential, Whole Foods, all this happened much faster than anybody thought it would. And you can see the uh, light rail station at the end up here and then you see it there. Okay, another piece of infrastructure being turned into a park. This is Jersey City, New Jersey. Uh, this is what it was like historically. Rail lines, rail lines, heavy industry, you know, just opposite New York City on the Hudson River. Beautiful pattern of rail lines. And this was known as the Harassmus Branch. Oops, sorry, I think this is running out of batteries. But you can see the historic photo, photo down there, the Harassmus Branch embankment. So what was interesting about this was that it was an embankment, not like the High Line in New York City, which is on a structure, but on dirt. So uh, beautiful stone walls and a ton of dirt holding up these rail tracks that uh, bridged block to block. So uh, an, an opportunity to make a linear park that will then connect to a waterfront uh, esplanade as well as greenways and bike trails throughout the region. And that's what the uh, embankment looks like. So it went up in grade. So you can see block one was where a developer is proposing to build high-rise residential. And in return, the whole rest of it will be a public park. So we visited, we, we managed to illegally climb up on top of one of these. Um, and that's the kind of ecology and landscape that has uh, sort of volunteered itself where these rail lines once were. Clearly somebody left a exercise bike or something up there. So we came up with this scheme that will re sort of reestablish a much more vibrant uh, biodiverse ecological system. What's there is volunteer and what's there is, is not very healthy soil. So we will have to reestablish a healthy ecological system, but we're thinking about it through all the seasons. So this sort of magically found wild landscape in the heart of a major city on top of this um, abandoned, once vibrant rail line. So we came up with this idea of creating a series, what we called the void scheme. So creating a forest and then clearings within that forest. And in each of those clearings, different kinds of meadows to support uh, both people using it as well as butterflies and birds, um, et cetera. And then coming down in scale, 
each of these categories, I come down in scale. This was Richmond, Virginia. This, we did a master plan for both sides of the James River. It was the best startup meeting for a project I've ever had. Sorry, Robert, even better than here, because we rode the rapids. It's the only state capital in our country that has class four rapid, rapids running through the heart of downtown. Uh, it was totally fun. Um, okay, so this was, a, this was a dam structure that was defunct and just sort of half there and half not there. Uh, teenagers would come out to the end of this and jump off into those rapids, kind of scary to imagine. But you can see the plan below, the plan we came up with was to actually make it a pedestrian bridge and connect the two sides of the James River, which really is connecting the haves and the have-nots historically um, and, creating, and connecting downtown to an emerging and growing post-manufacturing district uh, now where many people are living. So it was low-hanging fruit of this master plan for people to reimagine the James River as the heart of Richmond, not the edge, but the heart of Richmond. And this simple project that wasn't that expensive has changed the way people think about their city and their river. And as one um, columnist said, it's the closest you'll ever get to walking on water. So you're, you're really much closer to the water in the rapids than you would ever be on a, a bridge that, uh, that has cars. Um, and because it's historic, you're able. So we just added to that uh, infrastructure expanded it, connected it, lengthened it, and you can see even in winter people are using it. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to conclude, well I'm going to conclude with Dallas, but before I get to Dallas, um, water, dirt, and buildings. So we have some projects that are all of the above, that are fairly ambitious in scale, and Robert mentioned this one, this is Zariadia Park in, in Moscow. Um, for any of you who've ever been there, uh, this is the heart of Moscow. This is Red Square and the Kremlin and St. Basil's Cathedral on the Moscow River. So this really is the heart of a, it is the UNESCO, it's the UNESCO World Heritage Site. So these are protected UNESCO World uh, Monuments. So we were hired through, again, collaborating with Diller Scafidio Renfro. We were hired through an international design competition. We didn't think we had a chance of winning. We were shortlisted, and that was great. But there was a, a Russian team, a Chinese team, uh, three from the Netherlands, and one British, and us. So we were an American-led team, and we based our scheme on freedom of movement and uh, freedom. So we came up with this scheme that was about being able to walk anywhere and blurring the edges of paving and landscape. Wild urbanism, we actually called our scheme wild urbanism, bringing in, a, again, a thousand trees on 32 acres. And they wanted a lot of built program. They wanted four buildings, but we embedded those buildings. You don't even see the buildings. They're folded under the folds of the topography. So the idea was to bring the landscapes of Russia to this park so that in this park you would experience tundra, forest, uh, lowlands, and steppe, which is meadow. And to take the natural topography of this site, so it had a lot of slope down to the river, so to take that natural topography for each of those landscape typologies and fold that topography and create these kind of waves of uh, landforms under which the buildings would be tucked. So every building has a green roof and is completely uh, subsumed by the landscape. And then to come up with a landscape that would evoke those, those typologies, but live in Moscow, you know, thrive in Moscow, which by the way, everybody assumed we were trying to keep, create a landscape like in Siberia. No, it's the same climate as Minneapolis. So, you know, really not that hard to imagine, but to create a, a landscape that would be beautiful through all seasons, and then to create this system of paving that was neither paved nor planted but both, and blurring those edges so you could walk in a way that was not defined and that would allow the percolation of water through to be collected and reused on the site for irrigation, because underneath this is a giant parking structure, and also a big structure no one would tell us about. They couldn't show us the drawings for what was below this site. It was, at one time, the world's largest hotel. It was the Hotel Russia. So if anybody went to uh, Moscow in Soviet days, you stayed in this hotel. But it was one of those hotels where they gave you your one towel and your little bar of soap. It wasn't exactly luxury. And in fact, it, 
it had a fire and a lot of people died because it did not have good exiting. Uh, so they tore it down in the mid 2000s. And it, the site just remained there for all this time. At one time, at one point, Norman Foster did a master plan for the site that would have made it all commercial retail. But there was a grassroots effort, Moscow, there was a grassroots effort to make it a park. Now, once Putin said, I have this great idea, this should be a park, it happened. But it really was a grassroots effort. So you see this idea of paving that kind of just bleeds into these meadows, this birch forest, um, these clearings within the forest. And then you can see each of the buildings. Uh, you can see like a building here, but a, a grass, a green roof, a building here, but a green roof, one here, but a green roof, and one here, but a green roof. And then we created this giant hill under which from this side would be the new Philharmonic Hall. So that's a new major Philharmonic Hall. So coming from Red Square, that St. Basil's in the background, to bring the paving of Red Square, which is beautiful cobble painting, into the site, but as the floor of a forest, of a birch forest. To think of it at nighttime, because it gets dark at 4 o'clock in winter, and it's, you need light all the time. And then construction. So sorry for the blurry, but um, so underneath this big void, I'm sure it was a bomb shelter connected to the Kremlin underneath, but it was just this big street secret we weren't supposed to know about. Um, but they built this project from, from the time we won the competition to the time it opened was only four and a half years. And they had 3,000 people around the clock, three to 4,000 people around the clock building this project. And there you see it finished. And so you can see the context of St. Basil's and the Kremlin, the famous Goom department store, uh, Red Square. And those are all new trees. Uh, we didn't even we didn't think they were going to be ready for opening day, even the day before opening day. But miraculously, they were, and they took the fences down and opened the gates, and tens of thousands of people flooded into this park, and they still do every day. It's the most visited site in Moscow now. So one of the things that's quite, two of the things that are quite spectacular, besides the fact that it's a landscape and a thousand trees and a forest, is this glass crust that's over that hill, that's over the Philharmonic Hall. Under that glass crust, in the winter, it's warm because hot air rises. It's designed, we worked with Transolar at, to do climate augmentation in a natural way. So when you're under there in winter, you're warm. And then the louvers open in the, in the glass crust. So in the, in the summertime, which gets quite hot there, it's cool and breezy. And then the flyover bridge. So the flyover bridge is also a pretty spectacular moment. There's seven of these in the city, the famous Seven Sisters, that's the, sky, the, the skyscraper, they call it, in the background. So that's the tundra landscape, the glass crust over the amphitheater, and the landscape that's under, this is still during construction, you can see they haven't planted all the plants yet on opening day. But you get this view from up there of all the whole city. <clears throat> And it really does create this otherworldly place. We wanted people to feel lost from the city at times and then rediscover the city in this whole new kind of awesome way. So you have environments like this, the entrance from St. Basil's and Red Square, places where you can be in a forest, literally. Now, we, we heard that there was a little bit, maybe too much love of the forest happening. Um, but uh, but we were actually okay about that. It's like, okay, you're center of Moscow and people are making out in the forest. This is great. But the security cameras um, are there, as you can imagine. And then at times you're on top of the step, the meadow on this high hill down which you can sled in the winter. And you have this uh, whole prospect of the city. And the flyover bridge is this kind of magical place. Uh, where you walk out over the river and look back on the city and have a whole new uh, perspective of the city and the river that you don't otherwise have. And sometimes there's yoga classes, sometimes there's model shoots, and sometimes it's just people. So I'll conclude with Dallas, which is like all of those places, but combined into one and even better. So as Robert mentioned in 2004, we were hired to do the Downtown Parks Master Plan. And this was the sort of zoning our districts of the city at that time inside the loop. And here were the goals. Make parks, transform streets, replace surface parking. It's Texas. 
and increase, I put increase downtown's value, but really, pro, you know, increase the ta to tax that would come from these sites to help make the city a new place, and also create downtown's value as a place to be, as a place to live, work, and play. So in 2004, the plan was to create these signature core, core parks and then um, a, a series of parks within the loop, but in particular these four signature ones. So at that time called Main Street Garden, Griffin Street Garden, which became Belo Garden, Pacific Garden, which Chuck McDaniel, my friend from undergraduate school, has successfully brought to con conclusion. And then uh, at that time, Harwood Park was not exactly an idea yet, but West End Plaza was. And we did this scheme that was not just about creating parks, but creating mid-lot crossings, creating streetscapes that were pedestrian friendly, but also looking at what development these parks might spur around them. So that was just as important as the parks themselves. So Chan Krieger worked with us, Alex Krieger, now MBBJ, worked with us on this plan to look at uh, development sites and potential redevelopment sites um, around these parks. So we were diagramming them, their specific plaza as we envisioned it way back then, Below Garden as envisioned way back then, quite different now, but the idea was that each of these gardens and parks would be different and have different kinds of program and spur different kinds of buildings around them. So thinking about it in a coherent and cohesive way. Well, they all got built. I'll focus only on this one, the best one, um, because <laughs> this is the one we did with Robert and Maureen Deckard and the foundation, of course, and the city, of course, Willis Winters, who uh, was instrumental throughout all this work as well. So one of the things we were interested in was the fact that people would be looking down on this park. So we wanted to create something, Maureen and Robert said, we want something that's about plants and gardens and Texas and soft and beautiful. So different from Main Street Garden, different from Clyde Warren Park, um, a respite in the city, and we were interested in, in making that even embedded in the plan itself, the design of the plan itself. And it's great to watch people gather on this hill. It's amazing how much even just a little topography in Texas can make in a downtown so people gather on that hill or play in the fountain. And here you see it from above. It's not quite finished yet, but you get a sense of that pattern from above. So lots of successes. Those projects got built. So what next? Come back. What do we do now? So this was the 2013 update. So we took a look at the state of play, and we had within the loop 53, just over 53 acres of parks, as you see here in the green on the right, Compo comprised of existing parks, new parks, and small green spaces. But we were also very aware of how much downtown was changing. So this land use map, look at the yellow. The yellow is residential. So a lot of people moving downtown, completely changing the nature of downtown and the needs of downtown. So more parks needed. Um, and we looked at if we could add to those, we could get that number 53 up to 88.8. .8. So you see the stripes as new priority parks. So again, West End Plaza, Harwood, Robert took me out there one day and said, look at this site and imagine these buildings gone, these staying, and look at the views you would have of downtown and imagine the connections you could make to the farmer's market area, et cetera. And then of course, Carpenter Park, which I will talk about in a little more detail, and Pacific Plaza, which still had not been built at this time. And we looked at your competitive cities and how could we make Dallas compete in terms of parks per thousand residents in a downtown, for instance. So with those striped sites I just showed you, Dallas could become really competitive with the cities with which it competes for businesses and, and people wanting to live uh, and come. So now it's happening. So I was asked in the podcast before this, you know, what do you think is unique about Dallas? And I think one of the things that's unique about Dallas is you make things happen. It's like you make these plans and then you do them. And then you're like, okay, what's next? And then you do them. So now I'm going to end with uh, the, the uh, one signature park that has a great story that will start. I heard you, Robert, we're going to break ground in fall. 
Um, this is Carpenter Park, and it's called Repo, which I stole from the artist Robert Irwin, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So here's Carpenter Park, and um, here is Robert Irwin's portal slice, the long corten steel wall that sliced through the site that was framing, making a gateway around the exit ramp from I-35. So he was really responding to this condition and creating a, a portal, and that's why he called it Portal Slice. But it was a park that was not getting much use or much love. So Portal Slice was often covered in graffiti, and you can see the kind of patches along it. And meanwhile, that off-ramp from I-35 was going to be demolished. So there was no longer a portal along, uh, embracing or in, uh, creating a gateway around a freeway off-ramp. So uh, we were asked to take a look at how this, what this park might be uh, with this huge change. And not only does the removal of that off-ramp make a big difference to the way it could be used, it made it much bigger. So this is actually going to be the largest of the downtown parks. And the potential to connect to a growing East Dallas neighborhood, cultural district, residential district, stuff happening over there. So we called, we knew Robert, he was a, a, a friend, and um, George Hargraves called him and said, what do you think? And he said, well, that piece was conditional. He said, um, so with, with this no longer being the case, and this now being the case, you should just tear it down because it was a conditional piece. You know, it was, it was part of the whole environment. And with the environment gone and changed, you should just use it for scrap metal. So we came back and reported that to the city and everybody involved. And uh, at first, everybody was like, wait, yay, great. We can make a really great park. And then people were like, no, Dallas cannot be the city that demolishes an early Robert Irwin. Mary Margaret, you have to go back and convince him. So I don't know if it's in here. But I'll show you what I, so this is, these are some of those shots of the way it was. And then the, the, the demolition of the freeway off ramp and how Portal Slice was just sort of sitting there, a little bit forlorn. And the model we created of what it was and what it would be. and then the changing nature of the surroundings of it. And so the idea of being able to cr use a park to cr connect to all this emerging neighborhood. And also, we tried our darndest to figure out how to get this site and straighten Pearl. Maybe one of these days still <coughs> happened. So I, I did this drawing, which I sent to Robert, and I said, Irwin, Bob Irwin, and I said, okay, what do you think if we ret retrace the path of the freeway off-ramp with a walkway and we make it a pedestrian experience, but it recalls the way it was? And he laughed and he said, okay, um, I haven't heard from those guys for 35 years and suddenly they love me. Um, okay, you know, he really, he fought it at first. He said, no, they don't understand my work. If they think it still works on that site change, they just don't understand my work. And I'm like, Robert, they love the piece. They love you. You have, and he's like, okay. So he sent me this back. So he sent me this Chanel number no. five box, perfume box, like this big. And he wrote on it, plus one repo. And this drawing was rolled up in that box. And he took my, he took that plan I sent him and he Xeroxed it and he turned Portal Slice in this direction. And, he, and this was the drawing that was rolled up in the, in the Chanel box. Beautiful, beautiful little Mylar drawing where he said, let's turn it and I'm gonna change it. So he wanted to filigree parts of it. He wanted to cut filigree in parts of it. You may know his piece in, uh, at Wellesley College, which is this beautiful stainless steel low fence that runs through the woodlands that has these beautiful filigrees. They're not quite leaves, they're not quite birds, they're, but they're definitely organic in their nature, and it's really quite beautiful. It sort of appears and disappears. He goes, I want to do that, and I want to curve some of this corten steel wall and filigree the curved ends and create a gateway here in Food Truck Plaza. So he wanted to create a kind of place here by curving these ends. 
and filigreeing them. This is his drawing with the filigree ideas. So it happened. And I should have put in a picture of it happening in this amazing factory in Houston where they were rolling core tin to, to, to curve it using hot using heat and water, essentially. Todd is here. He knows exactly he was there. And then cutting this, these filigrees. Then we had to take those contract documents, and I have to give another nod to SWA because they did the contract documents, oh, the, lo, those many years ago. So we, we learned that those were not walls that were rectangular with dirt piled around them. They followed the shape of the topography with footings. So we had to catalog each segment of those walls and figure out how to create a new topography that would allow us to reuse the segments of the walls. And then we came up with this new plan. So a completely different kind of park, one with a central green, whoops, one with a central green, a hill, but but portal slice turned the other direction, making a connection under the freeway in the master plan, doing a, a recreation, a fee, a sports courts under the freeway in the master plan. And in the part we're building now, a food truck plaza, a amenity building, um, et cetera, a fountain at the corner, so that when you're driving along the street here, you will feel this corner, and then you'll feel the corner of Pacific Plaza. So driving along Pacific, you'll have these two parks that will feel connected one to another and relating one to another with corner beacons in both. So you will begin to imagine that you can walk in Dallas, that you can walk in downtown Dallas. There's a park there, and there's a park here, and there's a streetscape in between. Oh my gosh, we can walk. So gardens, fountain, uh, Children's Play, A Big Hill, Robert Irwin's Peace, and in the future, under the freeway, uh, whether the freeway is still there or gone, a great place for courts. And the phase one will be, um, as I said, the central green, this beautiful hedge that will line this granite walk that meanders through the heart of the park, the gardens, the corner fountain, um, the hill with portal slice, and then beautiful concession building here, bocce courts, games, dog park, so that the whole park won't be a dog park. And remnant orchards running through the site. So remnant uh, flowering trees in what seem to be these sort of remnant orchard rows. And a big jet, so you'll see it from afar with small arc jets around it for play for children of all ages. The gardens. And John Carpenter, back on the site, uh, welcoming you to this new park. And the Carpenter family has been very supportive and great partners in this whole process. And you will walk through Portal Slice into the heart of the park. And at the other end of Portal Slice is the food truck plaza and places to hang out and these beautiful filigree cutouts. And of course, the dogs. So thank you very much. <laughs>